Hey guys, post-production noob here, and real quick apology, I just want to apologize for the time it took to produce this episode. Uh, the main reason why it took so long to get this episode out is because the subject that we're going to be dealing with in today's episode is more of a concept than it is an actual circuit. So, as a result, one, you're going to be seeing uh, more animations and more diagrams and less redstone, uh, but that was primary, primarily the reason why it took so long to make this episode is because making all those animations and diagrams took time. Uh, but that said, because you're going to be seeing more animations, more diagrams, and less redstone, it, it, it's understandable if some of the stuff may be confusing. Uh, if you are having trouble following along with some of these concepts, I try to make these as clear and concise as possible, but if you're still having trouble, I would recommend just watching the video maybe two or three times. If it's still not making sense, as I always say at the end of these videos, feel free to leave questions and comments in the comment section. I will be more than happy to respond to them, and I usually get to them within 24 hours. So, just a little preface. That said, enjoy the episode. In the last episode, we added RAM and I.O. to our computer, which allowed us to introduce data to the computer during execution, store it, and then send it back out. In today's episode, we're going to be covering the stack, what it is, and how it's used in a computer. Before we begin, however, you may have noticed some cosmetic changes to the computer since the last episode. The RAM is now in line with the CPU, and the I.O. is moved to the other side. This, besides making things neater and closer together, is mainly to make room for future circuits, so even though things look a little different, this in no way changes the functionality of the computer. So, first things first, what is the stack? In reality, the stack is nothing more than a concept. There's no circuit that is the stack, and we can't build the stack because there's nothing to build. The stack is just a fancy way of storing and accessing information in RAM, and as a result, technically, our computer already has a stack. We just need to learn how it works. So, to understand how the stack works, let's imagine for a second that we're storing boxes on a shelf. If we wanted to store a box, we could simply find an empty location on the shelf and place the box there. Likewise, if we wanted to access a box, we simply pull it off the shelf. We can store and retrieve boxes anywhere on the shelf without affecting any of the other boxes because they're all supported by the shelf. Now, let's take away the shelf. If you wanted to store a box now, the only place you could put it is on top of another box. And if you wanted to retrieve that box, that's no problem. All you have to do is grab it off the top. But what if you wanted to retrieve a box at the bottom? You can't just grab the box and pull because then the whole tower would collapse. You would need to start pulling boxes off of the top until the box you wanted to retrieve is available. To tie the metaphor into our computer, RAM is a lot like storing the boxes on a shelf. We can place the data anywhere in RAM at any time and none of the other pieces of data are affected. However, the stack is a lot like storing boxes without a shelf. When we place a new piece of data onto the stack, we can only place it at the top of the existing data. And if we wanted to access data further down in the stack, we would need to unstack data until the piece of data that we were after became available. So, how do we implement this? Recall that the seventh register was set up to act as a pointer to memory. So, we'll use that as our stack pointer. First, we initiate it with the base of our stack, which in this case is zero, since we're not storing any data underneath it. Then, that's it. If we ever want to store or retrieve something from the stack, we simply perform a memory read or write with the address loaded in the seventh register. Easy as that. Uh, except there is a catch. The stack intrinsically has two rules that must be obliged to when using it. The first rule is anytime you write to the stack, the stack pointer must be incremented afterwards. The second rule is anytime you read from the stack, the stack pointer must be decremented beforehand. The result of following these two rules is the stack pointer will always point to the next available slot at the top of the stack. Even though this is easy to perform in software, it still requires two instructions whenever you use the stack, one for accessing the stack, 
and one for updating the stack pointer. Ideally, we would simply read or write to memory based on the stack pointer, and the stack pointer would be updated accordingly. So to do this, we're adding one more register to the computer to act as the stack pointer. However, we're not going to be using a regular register for this. We're actually going to be using a counter register, which we've used before in our program counter. Again, this design was made by Hans Lemerson. However, we're going to be modifying it a bit to get it to not only store a number and count up from it, but also count down. We do this by XORing the register's feedback lines with the control line, allowing us to invert it on cue. By inverting the feedback lines, the counter ends up counting down, which is what we need. We can now add a few extra lines, which allows us to read the contents of the stack pointer, write to the stack pointer, increment the stack pointer, and decrement the stack pointer. It's important to note that when incrementing, it's latched on the falling edge. This means that when we write to memory based on the stack pointer, the current value stored in the register is what will be used to point to memory. The data will be written to that location, and the register will be incremented by 1. However, you should also note that when we decrement, the stack pointer is latched immediately. This means that when we read memory based on the stack pointer, the register is first decremented, and then is used to point to memory. We configure the control lines like this to oblige to the rules of the stack, increment after writing, decrement before reading. Lastly, we need to connect the stack pointer to the address bus. So we add an enable line so that we can select when we're referencing this register. And then we can send this and the current address bus through an adder. This way we have the ability to add together the stack pointer, register 7, and the immediate bus to create our own address. So now we know what a stack is, what it does, and how to implement it in our computer. But the final question is why? Why do we need this and why is it important? In order to answer this question, let's examine a hypothetical situation. Suppose you are writing a really long program. Well, not really long. See, you have a few commands running to set up the CPU, then you have this really long subroutine, uh, then you run a few additional commands to set up the next phase, and you run the same subroutine again. Lastly, you run some more modifying commands, and you run the same subroutine one more time before presenting your answer and halting. We can see that the biggest part of this program is the subroutine that's repeated three times. Not only does this subroutine take up more space than necessary, but writing it can be tedious, if not mind-numbingly painful. What if there is a way to write this subroutine once, and then jump to it as we need it? As it happens, we can. By placing the subroutine elsewhere in memory, and placing where the subroutine was with jumps to the new locations, we now only have to write the subroutine once and jump to it anytime we need it. This makes it easier to program, and it also takes up far less space. So now let's walk through our program. We first set up the CPU, then we jump to the subroutine. The subroutine is executed, then uh-oh. We never added a jump back to the main program. So we'll add that in. We'll run the subroutine, jump back to the main program, and then perform our additional commands. We then jump to the subroutine again, execute it, and jump back to... Oh wait. This won't jump back to where we left off because it's already pointing back to the first time the subroutine was called. If only there was a way to store the current address before jumping to the subroutine then restoring the address when we were done. Well, if we modify our CPU just a little bit so that the program counter can be read from, and then attach it to the input of the registers, we now have the ability to, while the jump address is being loaded, store the program counter onto the stack for later retrieval. Meaning that when we're done with our subroutine, we can simply retrieve the address from the stack, and our program continues from where it left off. Just remember to add one to the address coming off the stack, otherwise you'll end up repeating the jump. You should keep in mind, though, that we will need to buffer the result bus to the register input bus, uh, 
since the jump to address will be presented on this bus, and we don't want it getting mixed up with the jump from address. The nice thing about this setup too is, because the stack can grow, so can the number of subroutines we call. For example, let's say the subroutine that we just created has three parts in it that are identical. We can now take those parts, move them to another part of memory, and replace them with calls of their own. Now when we call the main subroutine, the previous program counter address is pushed onto the stack. And when the main subroutine calls its sub subroutines, the current program counter address is pushed onto the stack as well. The sub subroutines can return to the main subroutine, and the previous program counter address is still safe inside the stack. Now you might be wondering to yourself, did we just do all of this just to give us another method of branching? And the answer is no. On top of being a way of tracking calls to subroutines, the stack can also take care of temporary data that the subroutine may use during execution, but then discard when it's done. This type of data is referred to as local variables, unlike the data that you regularly store in RAM, which is called global variables. The difference between the two is global variables can be used anywhere in the program, even in subroutines. However, local variables can only be used by the subroutine that is currently being executed. Neither the main program nor any subsequent subroutines have access to a subroutine's local variables. Now there are many reasons why using local variables is considered good practice, but explaining them here would take too long. So I'll simply explain how we create local variables, and I'll leave you to research why they're useful on your own time. To create a local variable, we follow something called the calling convention, which is a set of rules that dictate how the stack grows to accommodate things like local variables. First, the subroutine must allocate room for the local variables on the stack, and it does this by simply pushing either an immediate number or nothing at all onto the stack. As a result, the stack is loaded with the return address followed by any local variables that the subroutine might need. Once the local variables are declared, the subroutine can read them and overwrite them just like regular variables, for the most part. I say for the most part because the subroutine can't just address it with an absolute address like it would normal data in RAM. It needs to generate an address relative to the stack pointer. So to do this, one simply needs to send the stack pointer to the address along with the negative offset of the local variable through the immediate bus. For example, if I wanted to read the second local variable of a subroutine, I have to read memory based on the stack pointer minus two. This is why we gave our addressing circuits the ability to add the immediate value the seventh register and the stack pointer together, creating something known as a constant plus offset addressing mode. But wait, I thought reading based on the stack pointer meant you had to decrement the stack pointer. Well, here we encounter an exception to the rule. When reading or writing a local variable, it's always done relative to the stack pointer, but the stack pointer doesn't change. The reason for this is because we're no longer just using the stack to store single pieces of data but rather the status of the program, which could be considered to be an entire block of data. Each routine and subroutine in the program gets its own block of data, and it's these blocks that we stack and unstack as the program moves in and out of subroutines. So long as we are accessing memory inside these blocks, the stack pointer doesn't need to be updated. But as soon as we want to access something from the previous block, or assemble a new block, the stack pointer must be updated. These blocks are referred to as stack frames, and so far we've learned that they are comprised of the return address and the local variables. But there are a few other key components to a stack frame that we need to cover as well. Another key component of the stack frame is something called arguments. We briefly covered the concept of arguments in episode 2, but in this context, arguments are pieces of data that you can pass into a subroutine in order to affect its results. For example, let's say I had a multiplication program. If I wrote it to multiply 28 times 14, well, it would do that just fine. But what if I wanted to multiply other numbers? We would have to write our subroutine to instead multiply x times y, and tell it that x and y will be passed into it by the routine calling it. In this example, 
x and y would be the arguments passed into the subroutine, and they would of course be put onto the stack inside the stack frame. We do this in a fashion similar to creating local variables, but this time the routine calling the subroutine is responsible for placing the arguments onto the stack. So before calling the subroutine, the program first finds any arguments it needs to pass and pushes them onto the stack. Then the subroutine is called, and the subroutine establishes any local variables it needs, and execution continues. Accessing arguments as the subroutine again is very similar to accessing local variables. The programmer first figures out where relative to the stack pointer the arguments are, then they have the subroutine subtract that number from the stack pointer to address the argument. So once our arguments x and y have been passed into our multiplication subroutine, the subroutine can get to work multiplying our arguments. But when it's done, we expect it to return a result of some kind. We could just write our subroutine to use the result as we would, but if you want to reuse the subroutine and use the result in a different way, you'd have to rewrite your subroutine to cover all your bases. Or, we could just have the subroutine pass the result back to us. This, appropriately enough, is called the return value. While some people reserve a spot in the stack for this as well, most x86-based computers conform to the calling convention standard, which says that the return result must be replaced in the EAX register. Either way, the argument, return value, return address, and local variables create the stack frame, which is arguably one of the most powerful tools in a programmer's arsenal. Okay, so that was a lot of theory and not a lot of tangible examples. So let's wrap this episode up by showing you a program that uses everything we just learned about. So, what we've got is a program that will send out every number between 0 and x in descending order where x is an argument it requires. Now the program is quite simple. It first pushes 5 onto the stack and then calls our recursive subroutine. Now recursive subroutines are basically subroutines that call themselves and we're doing it this way to demonstrate the power of stack frames. Now our subroutine will take that variable, print it to the IO port, and if it's 0 it will return. Otherwise it calls itself this time passing the argument it was given, minus 1, and then returns. Doing this demonstrates that even though we only have one subroutine in our program, this subroutine can be called as many times as we need, and a new stack frame will be created with each call. And because each call gets its own stack frame, that means each call also gets its own arguments, local variables, and return addresses and return data. And all of them are completely separated, which means a subroutine instance can run and affect its own instance of data without affecting any of the other stack frames. Now the result of this is probably the most inefficient method of counting down from 5, requiring 12 lines of code, 44 clock cycles, and 12 locations in RAM, but it at least demonstrates the concepts of a stack frame. With that said, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you liked it, be sure to leave a like. Uh, leave any questions you may have in the comments, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. Subscribe if you want to be notified of any new videos, and make sure that bell is ringing. And be sure to follow me on Twitter to get updates on what projects I may be working on, or what projects I'm intending on working on next. Be sure to check out the world download on Planet Minecraft for the latest computer model. And be sure to join me in the next episode, where we will be giving this computer interrupt capabilities, and explore what you can do with them. I'll see you then. Bye!